Complexity grows because it's useful in solving problems. If you think back to the landings at Casablanca uh, in World War II, that was a problem that could be solved by great complexity, by great differentiation in structure, many, many different kinds of mater uh, military materiel, uh, but unfortunately not accompanied by corresponding organization. So it actually needed more complexity uh, to be a fully functioning complex system. Problems, when they're encountered, are often solved by developing more complex technologies. Think of hybrid cars. Uh, adding new positions, our social roles to an institution, or developing new kinds of institutions, or conducting new kinds of activities. This is illustrated um, by how we've responded to the terrorist threat and the terrorist attacks of, of September 2001. Um, if you think about how we have responded to these attacks, we have proliferated structure. We created new government agencies, Department of Homeland Security, Transportation Security Administration, and probably others that I'm not even aware of. We've reorganized other agencies, and we have increased organizational control over people's behavior. That's what it means when you go through the lines at the airport. So in response to the problem of terrorism, we have increased complexity. And of course, it has cost all of us, as we know. We pay for it in our taxes, we pay for it in the products that we buy, and we pay for it in annoyance when we stand in line at the airport. Uh, we also develop new technologies to try to deal with the threat of terrorism. Uh, these new body scanners that we're increasingly seeing at the airports, for example. Now, complexity is an economic function, um, it has costs then and it has benefits. Very often complexity works. Increasing in complexity works to solve problems. Uh, but over time, uh, as we tend to exhaust simple and cost-effective solutions, institutions then tend to develop inst solutions that are more complex and costly. And this has an important implication. Um, a prolonged period, well, I particularly want to emphasize that one. The changing complexity changes the benefit-cost ratio of complexity. As early, as simple solutions are adopted early in the history of whatever it is we're talking about, a particular institution or a particular technology and so forth, what remains to be developed are solutions that tend to grow more complex and more costly, and the benefit-cost ratio changes. This produces diminishing returns to complexity and can profoundly affect the future of societies over long periods of time. In particular, higher complexity forces societies to acquire more energy uh, to support the complexity, and this is how we support complexity today, of course, primarily through fossil fuels, while at the same time, having cheap energy permits and facilitates even higher complexity. So complexity requires energy, but having cheap energy permits us to develop more complexity, uh, we might say somewhat whimsically, and I call this the energy complexity spiral. They tend to be intertwined and to go either up together or down together. In fact, they have to go up together or down together. You can't have one without the other. You can't have complexity without energy, and if you have energy, you are going to have complexity. So let me switch to a little bit of history here. I'll try not to make it too detailed. Um, we'll try to go through this rather quickly, but I want to illustrate the process of how this makes a society vulnerable to collapse uh, by looking at the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is, is probably the single best case study that I've come across uh, that illustrates how societies increase in complexity to solve problems, but undermine their long-term sustainability in doing so. And so I've spent a number of years working on it. Um, in particular, the history of the Roman Empire illustrates how collapse our sustainability both emerge from problem-solving efforts. Now, when the Romans began to expand in the last few centuries BC, 
Uh, their expansion at first was highly profitable. For example, in 167 BC, the Romans captured the Macedonian treasury and immediately eliminated taxation of themselves. Uh, the state budget was doubled in 130 BC when they annexed uh, the state of Pergamon in Asia Minor. When Pompey conquered, the Roman general Pompey conquered Syria in 63 BC, the state budget was raised another 70%. And when Julius Caesar conquered Gaul, the value of gold in Rome fell by 36%. Now, the Roman Empire ran entirely on solar energy on non-mechanized agriculture. And when the Romans would conquer a province, what they would do is they would seize much of the accumulated surpluses of past solar energy uh, from the people they had conquered. Uh, past solar energy would have been transformed into precious metals, works of art, and people. Um, my colleague Tim Allen refers to this as, as the phase of loot and pillage. Um, so they had a positive feedback system going, more conquests gave more wealth, which funded more conquests. The problem with loot and pillage, though, is that you can only do it once. Um, conquest phases don't last very long. They certainly don't last forever. Ultimately, any expanding empire runs out of profitable conquests. And so two very important things happened then. Um, an imperial structure, a governmental structure and a military structure that had been built up on the income of conquest, of, of loot and plunder, suddenly when, when expansion stopped, had to sustain itself on yearly solar energy production. So they went from living on accumulated solar energy to having to live on annual solar energy, which is a little like some of the things that we discuss in a transition from petroleum, which is accumulated solar energy, to a transition to living on wind and contemporary solar energy. Now, for a one-time influx of wealth from each conquest, Rome then had to undertake administrative and military responsibilities that lasted for centuries. Uh, the state government is estimated to have been based 90% on agricultural taxes. Uh, there was very little industry, uh, primarily because of the high cost of transport. Now, subsistence producers generally produce very little surplus per capita, and I think later in the talk there are some statistics on this. As a result of this transition from living on accumulated solar energy to living on annual solar energy, uh, they had repeated fiscal crises during the first two centuries A.D. Uh, the first emperor, Augustus, often relieved the state budget out of his own wealth, um, but that, again, was part of the one-time uh, booty of conquest because that came from the conquest of Egypt. I don't want to go into too much detail on the Roman currency. Uh, I think the main thing you need to know is that they had a primary silver coin that was called in the, the denarius. In the first century AD, it weighed about 3.8 grams and was 98 to 99% pure silver, uh, a really excellent coin. Uh, diameter a little, a little thicker, a little larger than a dime, but thicker. And these are actually found all over um, Sri Lanka and, and southern India because they were traded there for spices and the merchants in India readily accepted them. There's even a record of a king in southern India proclaiming his admiration for these coins for their consistent weight and purity. They also issued coins in gold, but those did not figure in everyday commerce. They were simply too valuable. They were simply a store of wealth. Um, and then they had subsidiary denominations in brass and copper, <clears throat> which were used for most everyday purchases. Now, things were fine until the early 60s AD uh, when two things happened. One was a major war in the east with a people known as the Parthians. The Parthians had an empire that extended across uh, much of what's now Iran and Iraq, and the Romans were periodically at war with them. And then in 64 AD, there was the great fire of Rome. This is when Nero supposedly fiddled while Rome burned. And these two things, these two events were extremely costly and forced an economic reform 
uh, that consisted of debasing the silver currency. And this is right here. This is where you see it right here. Uh, the currency went from 98 down to 93% silver. And as you can see from the chart, that was the start of a slippery slope. And that's an example of the denarius coin right there. That, I think, is the Emperor Tiberius. If you ever saw the series I, Claudius, that's, that's Tiberius on that coin there. Um, we can skip most of this history. We don't need to go into it in detail until we get to the third century AD, beginning about 235 or so, where you can see they were already well down this slope. From time to time, they made attempts to reform the currency. There's one here, there's another little one here, uh, but they never took. They were never able to keep these reforms going uh, because the costs of government and military expenditures were simply inexorable. In the third century, the period of crisis came from 235 to 284. It was a half century of almost unrelenting crises. There were continual invasions of Germanic peoples from the north and the Persians or Parthians from the east. Uh, there were also chronic civil wars. Uh, Would-be emperors were constantly rising up and marshalling armies to challenge uh, the existing emperor, the legitimate emperor. And in fact, we know that over this 50-year period, there were as many as 50 usurpers. And every time there was a usurper, there had to be a civil war to put him down. Some of them were successful. Some of them toppled the existing emperor. The net effect was that many cities were sacked and frontier lands were devastated. Uh, and in fact, the situation became so bad in the 260s um, that the eastern and western parts of the empire broke away into rival empires. So the Roman Empire itself was reduced just to Italy and the Balkans and North Africa. The northwestern part of the empire, Spain, Gaul, and Britain, broke away and formed a separatist empire in the east. Um, Syria, uh, Palestine, most of Asia Minor also broke away into another separatist empire. There were various currency reforms attempting to um, address this problem, and it is really a history of funny money. Uh, in the year 238, they finally gave up on the denarius. They finally gave up on the denarius. Um, and introduced a new coin that we call the Antoninianus. Uh, the government proclaimed, that's one of these here, the government said that these were worth two of those, but they only weighed 1.5. Um, and things got worse from there, because very often the government would take these in in payment of taxes and immediately restrike them as one of these, just flatten them out a little, and strike a new image on it, proclaiming that it was suddenly worth twice as much. So simply by taking in money in taxes and striking new coins, the government made a 100% profit. Um, but they did it because they needed to, because the chronic problems were causing um, continual military expenditures, and that was the biggest item in the budget. Um, the Germans and the Persians penetrated far into the interior of the empire, uh, looting and destroying and taking people into slavery. And cities across the empire had to build new walls, including Rome itself. This is one of the Roman gates at the city of Trier in, in western Germany. Um, and the perimeters of cities shrank uh, in part because uh, cities were being sacked and people were being carried off into slavery, and in part also because they had to build the new walls around fairly small perimeters. So the city of Lyon, what's now Lyon in France, sank, uh, shrank from 160 hectares down to 20. Um, and Paris itself, I'm sure many of you have been to Paris, Paris itself contracted to the Ile de la Cité, which is the island on which uh, Notre Dame Cathedral sits today. Uh, it's not a very large area. But they did undertake reforms, beginning in the late third and early fourth centuries. And these in particular are associated with two reforming emperors, Diocletian and Constantine. Constantine, at least, I'm sure you've all heard of. And here's what they did. 